Welcome to another episode of Follow the Brand TV. I am your host, Grant McGall, CEO of Five Star BDM, a five star personal brand and business development company. I want to take you on a journey through another deep dive into the world of personal branding and business development using compelling personal stories, business conversations, and tips to improve your brand. By listening to the Follow the Brand TV series, you will differentiate yourself from the competition and build trust with prospective clients and employers. You never get a second chance to make a first impression. Make it one that will set you apart, build confidence, and reflect who you are. Building your five-star personal brand is a great way to improve your skills and knowledge. If you have any questions for me or any of my guests, please email me at grant.mcgall at fivestarbdm.com. Now, let's begin with our next episode on the Follow the Brand TV. Hello, hello, hello. Let's let everybody get in. I want to say good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Wow, we've got a full house. I love how they all just pop in like this. This is uh this is wonderful. So I am Grant McGall. I'm the CEO of Five Star BDM and host of the Follow the Brand podcast and TV show. Today we are going to talk with industry experts who are at the intersection of technology, disability, and accessibility. We will discuss the potential to greatly improve the lives of individuals around the world in a number of ways. We will explore assistive technology that will help people with disabilities perform daily activities that may be challenging for them. We will talk about communication technology to access information and knowledge social inclusion technology, which can also help to reduce social isolation for people with disabilities by providing opportunities for them to connect with others and participate in social activities. The intersection of technology, accessibility, and disabilities can lead to a more inclusive and equitable society where everyone has the opportunity to participate fully and achieve their goals. However, it is important to ensure that technology is designed with accessibility in mind from the outset and that people with disabilities are involved in the development and implementation of these technologies. So let's introduce our panelists. Who we got here? Oh, we got a lot of, lot, lot of good people. We're going to start for, and go to my right. I'd like for you to introduce yourself and to state your passion for what is it that you saw with your skill set. So Dulce, I'd like to start with you. Hey, so I'm Dulce Berga, a technologist who builds avatars and builds worlds. Um, been spending the last three or four years now building virtual spaces and avatars um, for clients and different events. Made a virtual chess game on WebXR and I'm currently building out sets of avatars for several different metaversal spaces. Um, I uh, attended the MIT hackathon um, this past January and Marcus was on my team and we won. Um, And it was very centered around accessibility for people who have been disenfranchised um, and utilizing technology to help them do that. Excellent, 
Well, since you called him out, we'll go to Mark. <laughs> go right ahead. Yeah, thanks for that uh, that nice segue, uh, Dulce. Um, so I'm Marcus Anderson. I'm a cyborg anthropologist. Um, and basically what that uh, discusses uh, is the interconnections between humans and technology. Um, and it really creates this discourse that breaks down those boundaries. Uh, so to say, as we are creating technology, technology is also creating us. And so being mindful of the prompts and uh, the inputs that are going into building hardware and software, I think it's important to have uh, multiple uh, amounts of voices when it comes to actually the creation of what the future looks like. Um, and so through that, uh, yes, we've been uh, working uh, hard and diligently to uh, create these different on-ramps uh, when it comes to the unhoused, uh, helping them to actually visualize, conceptualize uh, their dream home, and then we'll be able to use those tools to actually make that vision a reality. Oh, man, that's wonderful work. Wonderful work. How about Giselle? Take myself off a of mute there. Hi, everyone. Giselle Mota. I am. Uh, I do a lot of different things. So if you see me out in the world, you'll see that I'm the chief of product inclusion at ADP. But for this call today, I have a personal project that's called Nifty Collective. And uh, basically, I just continue my love for inclusion and my passion for uh, people with disabilities. I myself am dyslexic. Uh, I talk a lot about neurodiversity and how do we bring into uh, digital representation, but also extended reality and mixed reality. Like how do we bring disability inclusion, representation and accessibility into things like AR, VR, um, gaming of all different types. So our project right now, we, we got invited to create a game on the sandbox uh, in the metaverse with our avatars and characters that represent people from all around the world with disabilities um, and differences, visual differences. So we have people with, our avatars have vitiligo, they have, their, you know, we have an acid attack victim from India, a woman, and um, just, we try to represent everything that we can. And we're trying to really normalize that disabilities and visual differences and even neurodiversities, they're all part of who we are. And we could, we should have the choice to represent that even in our digital identities. Right. Completely agree. Thank you for sharing. How about Dr. Ed? Hey, thank you very much, Grant. Um, my name is Dr. Ed, and I'm just a geek kid who was uh, shown forgiveness by his grade seven French teacher. Uh, I needed this forgiveness because I was caught cheating um, in my in school. Uh, you see, I also had um, undiagnosed ADHD probably dyslexia as well. And I kept falling further and further behind in school. Uh, and I thought I was, I thought I was dumb. Uh, so cheating was the only way that I would make it through school. But when my French teacher, instead of suspending me and telling my parents uh, about what I did, uh, Mr. Belanger said, you know, I know Ed's struggling, but he's creative, so it's gonna be okay. I'm gonna give him opportunities to share this creativity within his class. And that's been my focus uh, throughout all of my, all the way up to my PhD. Um, and right now with AI parenting, I'm focused on how can we make the learning of the, the fundamentals behind the met metaverse uh, a little bit more accessible. So here we're, we're getting kids to build like little robots uh, and things with wood, toys that they can take home uh, so that it becomes not just a thing that a video that you watch, but something that you can hold in your hand because the, the aspect of robotics is very important for the next phase. Awesome. Awesome. I, I'm, I'm loving this panel already. I'm going to go all the way down to the bottom on my screen. And so that is Sh Shakar. Shakar Oz. <laughs> Oz. Oz is fine. Oz is fine. Oz is fine. Oz is fine. I'll go with that. <laughs> my, my name is too complicated. My first name. Uh, well, I have been... Um, I have been for the last uh, 15 years, I guess, I, I since I started working, um, I have been wrapped around with the two big let's say areas or hats one is the technology the emergent one either it's video games i started as a video game designer developer and uh, then it uh, augmented reality came out and then there was virtual reality and then there was uh, 3d sensors and depth sensors etc and ai machine learning compute and on the other side i have a big hat a bigger a lot of activity in education until today, I'm still teaching uh, young. Uh, I'm working very closely with teachers, either with students or with teachers, uh, in parallel to all my work. 
And to respond to your question, the very good question about motivation, I think that the the motivation that drives me is the to make people smile and happy. I think that the point is that we 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 must uh, and realize in the end that we are here for limited time whether we come back here or not another life but we we will we are here for a limited time and the, the what drives me is that the fact that we just have to be uh, a big happy community and spend our time here well and make sure that it will stay alive also for the future uh, that's my <laughs> my motivation you are most modest uh i saw some of your work that you do and i i couldn't believe the work that you did with an individual with disability <laughs> and they were playing a guitar like in air and yes. it's beautiful it made me smile it made me feel happy it made me feel connected and for that person who through technology were able to actually have that interaction. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Yeah, I, I really connect to what uh, Ed was saying and also what um, Giselle was saying. I also, I am also, I, I think we are three now here. Maybe there will be also, I don't know, we will see. But I, I also had uh, the this kind of unidentified ADHD. Uh, eventually, I, I was identified because of, again, because of a teacher that told me, listen, you cannot fail that test. Obviously, you are a good student. So just go to do this test. And eventually, they found it. Uh, but in any case, uh, the point is that uh, accessibility is close to my heart as well. Yes, it's a big area. But OK, we will speak about this later. Awesome. And then we got Barik. I know he's a big speaker. So we're going to save him for last. So hit us with it. Uh, hi everyone, um, thank you very much. Uh, very Rivki here from Djibouti, that tiny country in East Africa. Um, I'm a ranking member <clears throat> in the public administration. My main mission is to get technology accessible for all. May it be for the public sector by implementing laws or working NGOs, you know, or working with the NGOs. So um, helping them to create and to innovate by that, helping gather the best minds actually and try to foster what we can call uh, that shift that we are going through technology these days and coming from an African country that, that has um, beautiful, beautiful infrastructures when it comes to, to telecoms. So I'm here to bring a new perspective coming from a government admin and I'm not that hot, like I didn't um, create, I, I haven't created anything uh, that exciting as Dr. Ed and us, but we'll try to keep up with you guys. No, it's about, that's why we have a well-rounded panel we want to have good discussion and our audience that's out there that's listening we want you to chime in we want you to to go into the chats send your thoughts out there let's have an interactive discussion we're going to have a discussion right we're going to talk about some things because you know when i think about things and i think about disability and i remember you know i'm a little older than maybe than a couple of people here but i remember that a lot of legislation had to happen just to have you know the same access to a building, you know you, you know we weren't we were building things and designing things without even thinking about other people that might that might be a challenging type of design if you if you build it. So we had to get, become more conscious, and I think that's what we're talking about now. So this is gonna be an open discussion. I want you to chime in. I I, I use the term barbershop discussion. You see beauty shop discussion as well open forum we're going to have some discussion i want you to chime in with your passion because that's what's going to get the audience involved and we're going to really have some scintillating conversation that can get some things done so the first question is about accessibility and technology for all people regardless of ability how would you approach that Um, I think, I think, were you reaching out to any particular person, Grant? All right, I'll try, I'll start, I'll get the ball rolling here. So I think that um, something I even try to tell people to change their mentality when it comes to accessibility and, and the products is that, yes, we are designing for all, but we're also designing for the sum and you can do both at the same time. They don't have to be mutually exclusive. And we don't often realize how many products we use on a daily basis that started by uh, maybe focusing on an individual group of people, right? So Siri, 
we might use, you know, again, with me, I love to get information from speech to text. I don't really like reading that much. And uh, reading comprehension was a struggle for me in school, Dr. Ed. So, you know, I also felt that way growing up. But, you know, any kind of tool like that actually started with people with disabilities in mind, people who weren't able to use their keyboard to text with their hands and fingers. And so today we use it commonly. So I think if we start to design spaces like extended reality, the metaverse, um, all these different types that types of conversations that we're having, if we start to design it with the sum in mind, we will design for all. Eventually it will become commonplace. Everyone will like to use it in that manner. And so I think we just need to normalize it a little bit. I, I think we're also missing a key component to um, society in general is the infrastructure around enabling accessibility and giving, giving it to people who aren't um, able to go to certain places or, or participate in certain things because the infrastructure is not set in place for them to um, have that accessibility. And that really starts with um, us as technologists figuring out how we take the technologies that we're building and filter that into everything around society. And what does that mean? I mean, if we're building out spatialized existences and spatialized experiences, we need to come up with systems that can handle the hardware, can handle the software, can handle the people. And, um, and then what does that look like? You know, if we're walking around with virtual reality glasses on or augmented reality glasses on, and we're shifting back and forth between real life and this virtual space, how, does, how is that set up for us? And, and, and how is it including everybody in that configuration? You know, what is the haptic experience like? What is the tracking experience like? What are the guardians like? Um, how do they interact with somebody who doesn't necessarily, can't necessarily hear or can't see or have um, limited mobility? You know, what does that all mean moving forward? And I think that's where we really need to start. Um, if I can um, add on top of yeah. uh, what Dolce just said, um, I think that the infrastructure is absolutely very important and it's important to understand like AI is basically the, it controls the, what you see on the internet and controls attention. Uh, and it, it's the type of power um, that exists there. And so I do feel like it's, it's super important for us to be aware of uh, the underlying infrastructure that is the AI systems that are, are doing a lot of the controls. Um, and the other thing I would add is like, when we talk about accessibility for all people, uh, I think we also need to recognize the 44% of uh, people in the metaverse who are from China. They don't speak English as uh, like their natural language. Um, I think of, you know, um, there are many people who are advocates for this space, but I do think unless we really consider the different languages as another uh, point of accessibility, uh, we're, we're going to have difficulty uh, connecting. We're going to be more divided. Uh, we're going to be less connected. Interesting. Interesting. You like um, that? The, <clears throat> yeah, but <clears throat> I, I, want, I wanted to add something about this because if we go with the mindset, with the, the mindset of creating um, new applications, new services, etc., when it comes to metaverse, uh, I think that many of you will be will be okay with me when will, will agree with me with the fact that um, let's think about let's think about what are the solutions that we are bringing to these communities that are. Um, I'm, I'm not talking about Europe. I'm not talking about the U.S. I'm not talking about Japan and all these you know developed countries, but. Be, as, as, as you said in the question, this is accessibility for everyone. <clears throat> being, being in a third world country today, today is a handicap for, for a majority of people that can actually use um, the metaverse, AI, VR, etc., etc. So I think that we have to go with the mindset of what are the solutions that we are bringing to, 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 to these communities to actually build on it and then give them uh, or, or you know, create solutions as a as a whole for them to to have these 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 um these connections or this this connectivity or 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 this 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 applications just just to build upon what uh dulce and doctor you know uh now, without a question the thing about we sometimes we take things for granted i live in the us i live in miami florida so you always have an always on type of infrastructure you know whether it's electricity or whatever you're, you're just used to that not understanding in other parts of the world that is not the case and what does that really look like? Because as we go back to the original question, we talk about design, 
we talk about accessibility and we realize even right now people there's a lot of people that don't even have accessibility to current physical and digital realities and then i want to pivot just a little bit because i did this just just before we jumped on i i said well you know what i'm not sure how to pronounce some of the names i'm going to go into this app and say hey you know tell me how to pronounce the name and some of the name they said we don't we, we can't help you we don't know that name we don't know how to pronounce it it's not in the database i'm sure in your respective countries not you know it's not that unique however it's not there it's missing so you have a whole missing symphony of sound and light and meaning and consciousness and whatnot that is normalized in other parts of the world but then not to who, who are the designers and the creators of the platforms so my question is this how do we promote social inclusion and accessibility for marginalized communities yeah, maybe I can jump in um, there. You know, a lot of the work that I do uh, really focuses on relationships, right? What is my relationship to myself? What is my relationship to the community? And what is my relationship to the planet? And I think, you know, through this relationship building, we start to build what is called kinship. Now, kinship is kind of the action of being in relation uh, to something. So it's really about going out and understanding your user, right? Understanding who is going to uh, be involved with your technology, you know, from a design wise, I think it's really important to keep accessibility in mind from the beginning, from the conception of the development process, right? And I think through that, you get additional uh, developers um, having the ability to test these products with a diverse group of users to really identify and fix the accessibility issues. And I think even from a policy perspective, I think governments should have this piece where they set an accessibility standard and regulations that these things are integrated into the process of um, these products and services from the onset. Um, and then more importantly, I think it's about conducting user research and really getting an intimate human-centered design approach to who you're actually building for and creating that language around. Um, your products and services that fit a wide range of, of, of users. I would uh, I would add another point. The when 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 we start designing a product uh, in from user experience design, I, I am my, let's say my my big chunk of, of, of history. If if you ask me who I am professionally, I would say user experience design. Even even though I do a lot more. But from user experience design, the, the the first question is who is the person, who is the user that you want to design for, and as as uh, the others said also before, even if even if I uh, so one of the projects that I showed Grant before is that even a project that we did for a specific child or a specific uh, uh, person in a wheelchair or a specific person, whoever that was that we did a we solved one of these problems. Once we found a solution for one person, it doesn't mean that the solution is only for one person. It, it, there are several other people. I don't know how many, but the, the Institute knows and they, are, they were able to uh, kind of spread around the solution, whatever that was, whether it's an interface for a computer, whether it's a a video game because the guy wanted to play a little bit, whether it's whatever it was that, that he needed at the time. And the, the idea was that whatever you do, you allow someone to do something he couldn't do before. And even if it's only for that one person, which in accessibility, it's really, it's, you really have to understand the, the specific situation of, of that person. Even in this case, it's still something that you can uh, scale up uh, later. And uh, to say one last thing uh, before, before your second idea, in video games, every time you select a character, normally we know, I mean, as video game designers, we know that normally you would select not a character that is like you like your personality. I actually, most of the times you select someone that is the opposite of you or someone that has something that you don't. 
just in order to try something or to experience something else or to try to explore personalities. And uh, the, this is also some type of accessibility because you are able to explore something. And I would say that this is some kind of... Um, uh, when when we talk about the metaverse and having one avatar for your for your for yourself in many uh, many areas, it actually contradicts a bit this kind of uh, principle. But we can talk about this also later. But in in a way, the 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 accessibility or exploration of uh, of different uh, uh, products, I think that would be that would that it, this is an important point of the. Of the, for the future, yeah. Interesting. Um, I'd like to add, I, um, I just was at CES in January and um, I actually felt like I saw the um, byproduct of the last probably like six or seven years of diversity inclusion in technology. Like I actually saw the byproduct of what that was at the CES and there was a lot more um, technology that was inclusive. Um, there was more technology that was around accessibility, utilizing robots to help people with different types of um, disability issues. The biggest winner was um, a device to help women who um, shake or have limited mobility in their hands to put lipstick on. Yeah. I mean, just something very simple like that. Like, and that was the big winner at CES where it like stabilized the, the handle so the woman could actually put lipstick on her lips and feel pretty. Um, I mean, simple things like that uh, to really focus on accessibility, I think is very important. And it's the opposite effect of what was happening like maybe 20 years ago when cameras started to roll out and it couldn't see dark skin. Mm -hmm. It was only seeing light skin. Well, so we've had the last 10 years of really opening up our labs to different types of people with different types of needs and issues. And that started to, I started to see that unfold at um, CES and that was pretty encouraging. And another thing that I think is really encouraging, like on a society level, I mean, we just had the um, Super Bowl and while Rihanna was performing, there was an, an American Sign Language performer who just like stole the show from everybody and, you know, and she went viral. And that was very exciting for me to see because to me, I think American Sign Language should be the gesturing that we use in, um, in spaces, in these spaces and with the technology. It should be what the gestures that we should be adopting as, um, as what we use to communicate with AI and with the you know, cameras and the hardware and such that's sensing us and tracking us. And then that will really open up the world to everybody. I mean, if everybody knew how to do American Sign Language, I mean, that would just be pretty amazing. The world would be a lot quieter, It'd be nicer. <laughs> Interoperability. Um, because we have so if, many languages. If I can add, um, yeah, go ahead. Like when it comes to uh, promotion, uh, I I feel like if we go back to like say the 1950s, 1960s, um, this isn't one that got like popular opinion. Like it didn't sway popular in uh, opinion. Um, it was basically family associations, the advocacy of those small family associations over a long period of time uh, that ended up like developing and validating the practices for children with disabilities and their families in schools. And then it was years and years later, like 15 years later that we have, you know, like this turned into a law of any sort. Uh, so I see like a lot of the public advocacy right now is going to be small groups of parents. But when you start realizing that you know, this this type of ableism is is pretty systemic and it, it's every equity seeking group is kind of impacted in the same way. You start to realize that they, they are not the minority. In fact, they are the majority. And so these voices become bigger and bigger. And then eventually you get to the point where uh, they'll say, like, we've got over, you know, um, three about four million students in 1976 that were, you know, in the school age. Um, and they are being served by like these these disability acts. So I think that uh, it's important to recognize that every person who who is impacted has a family and they have others that are, are with them. And so the advocacy is is much, much bigger. But it starts with like those those strongest advocates. Um, I think uh, Marquez was uh, referring to kinship, like you, you find those people, you find your people, and then um, that kind of gets things going, uh, in, especially in this case. Yeah, speaking of advocacy, I'm thinking when you say that 
so many different groups like behind the scenes are coming together and making these associations to help impact what we normally see, such as the Grammys, such as some of these NFL games, such as like, et cetera. And behind the scenes, there's these groups of people who are now advising. I know that for the Grammys this year, there was this group of people that were, um, Lachi is a, is a woman who is a blind musician. She's a black woman. She's a musician and doing amazing things. She sits on this board for, um, artists and musicians, and she helps to kind of navigate disability inclusion for the Grammys. So there's a lot of work still to be done, but when we start to see certain things, like uh, when we're looking at these public events and we're seeing that, yes, there's like, I, didn't, um, I believe that it was a few events recently where we had some sign language interpretation, where we had all these different things. It's because behind the scenes, people are gathering and advising and, and pushing. And one of the things I'm trying to do as well and I, I'm sure everyone here is in, in their capacity. I heard Bar um, Barik as well kind of mentioned from, from his angle is trying to get in front of the people who are creating and investing tons of money into technology platforms. So I got in front of Ericsson. I've spoken in front of many different technology platforms and all these people who are investing and saying, but we need to think about accessibility. We need to think about disability inclusion. It must be ingrained in your design process because it, it didn't start that way, but we need to catch up. So I think voices like that and all these other people, uh, it's very important towards that advocacy. Man, I wanna hear from Barrick. We have a we have a question that came or a statement that came from the audience from Africa saying, if progress is to be realized is under in underdeveloped nations, gatekeeping and gatekeepers need to step down. Do you agree or disagree with that? That's for you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> gatekeeping and gatekeepers need, 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 need to step down. Uh, I have a hard time understanding what that means. Um, I can't, I can't, I really can't answer that. If, if, if somebody can help and, and, and explain what gatekeeping and gatekeepers mean. It means, it means people who think that there's a certain way to do things. And if you deviate out of that certain way of doing things, then you're doing it all wrong. And they have oh, okay. to tell, and they tell you, oh, you're doing it completely wrong. It's got to be done this way. And that's well, usually uh, people who think that they know what, you yeah. know, yeah. <laughs> well, well um, the thing is, um, coming from an African or, or an underdeveloped um, nation is, um, it's true that in government, we like to think that we know everything and this is how things should be done. And um, we do... Um, um, get in touch with experts, international experts, and et cetera, et cetera, what have you, to actually implement um, implement actions into, into uh, territories or implement new ideas, et cetera. And, but the social reality actually is fighting for, this is not how we can, or how we can accept these things. I'm not talking about technology here. I'm, not, I'm talking you know, in, a, in a general way. Um, it's true that, um, I will not go as further as saying step down, but it's today in 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 the governments that we have, and I'm talking about about mine. We have youngsters, we have um, young people actually um, 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 working in 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 places that can actually pull everyone pull every, everyone in in a in a way, and then let them think by themselves. Let them do stuff by themselves. This is this is why I said at the beginning, I am working with implementing laws, but I'm also working with NGOs to actually help them create, help them innovate, to help the, the community. <clears throat> you see, so I think that if we have this balance, we need that balance, uh, that balance with understanding what the social reality is, and understanding how um, we can all work together to actually implement whatever we need to implement. And, 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 as, and as, as I said, um, in Africa or in underdeveloped countries as a whole, it's, um, it's nothing can work if there is no solution. Like let's, 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 let's remind ourselves about the mobile, how the mobile penetration came, how mobile phone actually exploded in Africa. It was because of the mobile banking. Is because it's um it's a solution for, for for everyone, and and the penetration today is maybe if if, if I'm not wrong we're going to 
85 to 86 percent of, of penetration into the whole continent. So, um, so what are the solutions? <clears throat> the gatekeepers will still try to fight, but there is a shift. There is a shift now going into the governments, into the parliaments, into you know people are, are understanding that youngsters. Uh, communities, NGOs, these are the ones that we can rely on to actually drive uh, whatever uh, whatever change needs need, need to be done. Yeah, the, I love this discussion. We, we're can, getting... I can I offer a counterpoint, um, like you, on the opposite side? <laughs> oh, one, one, one second. We're going to give you a minute because we've got questions. I see them all coming in. But now, go ahead. Let me hear what your insight is, Dr. Ed. Um, okay, so when I was advocating for uh, school councils, um, one of the, the superintendents told me, like, we don't talk to those people. Uh, those are the enemy. And um, I've kind of realized over time that essentially when we are doing that, like we say, like these gatekeepers or other people um, are like people that need to step down. It also says that we're not going to listen to them. It says that, you know, their voice isn't really that important. And my feeling is these are the kinds of things that tend to limit our creativity. Um, and they are the things that prevent us from seeing the possibilities that will help all people. Uh, and so my emphasis is don't limit your creativity and recognize recognize like if we can build this up so that uh, it becomes a the more diverse the teams, uh, especially at the decision making table, uh, the more ideas we have at the table, the more solutions that we can come up with. If we force ourselves into this this hole of uh, it's only people who are like me and I will only listen to those types of people, then we have all sorts of problems. You're going to be excluding all sorts of people in your decision making. And so it is very important to keep that open mind. Don't limit your creativity uh, in order to get over those barriers. So it's it's a hard thing to do um, because you don't want to listen to people. We're very polarized, like where AI has made us very like one side or the other. But it is really, if you listen to the, each side, there, there's a lot of things that are very common between them. And I'm a huge advocate for there, there's common ground. Let's find it. Well, you also got to remember that a lot of um, a lot of our society is built on bureaucracy and it's built on processes that people have set in place that they don't want to let go and it benefits them or it benefits their people only. Um, and it's detrimental to everybody else. I mean, look at climate change. We're suffering from bureaucracy and climate change right now. And that's a lot of gatekeeping in itself, right? You know, we have new things that we want to do and we're not implementing them because it's going to hurt the pocket of somebody who has been living off of that process for generations, right? And um, one of the things that uh, was very important to our MIT project, Marcus and, and my MIT project, was to instill the idea of um, being nomadic in this country. Um, this country was a nomadic country to start, and we came in and we settled it and we paved it and we made it, you know, a huge bureaucracy of, of sorts. Um, and it doesn't really serve us anymore. It never really did serve us. It only served the government so they could keep track of us and only serve um, a certain portion of society who had the means to, you know, get estates and generational wealth and whatnot. But the average person, um, this system isn't necessarily tailored for them. So with our project um, of creating tiny homes and communities that encourage nomadic living, encourage the moving around around the country to follow the migration, to follow the weather, um, I think that right there in itself is a simple thing, but it completely goes against everything that this country has been established on and what it means to be an American and what it means to own something and to have, you know, your stake in the ground with your flag. Um, so, yeah, you know, we got to we got to think about things a little bit a little bit differently nowadays. I'm, I'm in right now because this is so good. We're having a great discussion because we're talking about society. We're talking about social engineering, right? And what does that look like? We have to understand, if we want to call it that, but from the uh, last 10, dec the 10 years, the decade, how we've been social engineered through social media, and that you've got certain players in place that have really benefited a lot from, from gaining our data and understanding our behaviors and that type of thing. So it's explosive. To Barak's point, what he said, it's about adoption. 
This was such a huge adoption with mobile technology and it just blew up. No one anticipated that. You know, uh, MySpace was around for a long time before Facebook, but why now? What happened? Well, there's other technologies that kind of help to kind of uh, foster that growth. We're now at a different point. And we're at a point now that this newer technology is a game changer because it's shaping finance, it's shaping the technologies, changing society. Here we are in this group setting right now, and we're located all over the globe. So we're having much more engaged conversations that we would never have had, let's say even five years ago, or you know, 10 years ago. We, we, would, we would not have come together the way that we are to discuss these things because the power is in the people. The people can shape the technology if they become more active, be proactive. This is what we're looking at Web3. Why people like Web3? Yeah, it's on a blockchain. There's some tech to it, but the ownership aspect of it, the thing that Dulce just talked about, like, wow, it's a game changer. I can change how the game is being played. So you're going to get polarization with that because that's just something they're going to be losers and winners and how this thing is going to move forward. Not to lose why we're talking about right now, because you talked about housing. Let's talk about some of these other things that technology can shape and change the way that we live in a complete society when it comes to transportation, it comes to independent living, it comes to all these things about language that you talked about, all these barriers that are between us can now be sunset. Who would like to chime in on that conversation? Yeah, I was gonna say that the that what we're talking about, about kind of like breaking the rules and starting explode this thing and start over again. You know, even within what we talked about, you user experience and design, even UX itself, if you talk to any UX designer, they're going to say that they have a set of standards that they're supposed to go by and they almost fight by that thing. They're like, no, we have to design this certain way and these are the principles and they get very particular about that world. I work with UX designers every day. So it's like, I think that it's even challenging what we've learned. It's challenging what does normal look like? Do, do you, to Dulce's point, like, do you have to, you know, live this certain way to say that that's what success looks like? No, you can migrate, you can live in different places, which then opens up the concept of us considering others, consider the migration that exists around this world and the refugee crisis that is all around this world. And what about those people? And then it goes back to how do we give access to those people to have certain technology at their hands? How do we, so it's such a beautiful ecosystem what we're talking about today, but I think it requires us to really intentionally break patterns, break rules. And I would encourage anyone who's out here listening that's trying to do any project whether that's if you're, you know, adopting chat GPT, if you're creating metaverses, if you're creating avatars, extended reality, this is the moment right now to really blow it up, to, to be rebellious, to break the rules, to do something with inclusion in mind, to really break it because uh, this is the inception of something new and, and we can really change that. Love it. Love it. Yeah, I wanted to chime in real quick. Um, I think when you know we think about technology, I think that is a great point, uh, Giselle. But when we think about technology, um, you know, sometimes we get ahead of ourselves and we kind of think that it's all technology is always forward, right? And the way that I like to look at it is that there's a lot of indigenous practices that actually approach technology in a way that we need to get back to right and when it comes to community building when it comes to relationships when it comes to self-actualization even um, and i think you know from humans first kind of perspective of putting that first wall up right to protect us from the elements we've been building in that manner of like what can actually like box us in you know if you look at our homes there are boxes and rectangles but how about we get back into this more natural symbiotic relationship with uh, the planet, right? And I think through that aspect of understanding that we are part of this larger organism, we will start to create these technologies that are actually in alignment with that. And I go to say there's this uh, gentleman, um, James Edwards, he's a professor who actually created this position paper called um, uh, Indigenous Protocol and in Artificial Intelligence. And he created these workshops with a lot of indigenous people from uh, the Polynesian islands. And he asked these practitioners, you know, what is the way that you guys would create hardware and software. And basically what they said is we would take the same considerations 
that as if we were creating a sweat lodge, if we were creating a ritual, if we were creating something that needed deep consideration that would have effects for generations to come. And I think if we start to get back into this mind frame of saying that technology is a tool that we can actually utilize, but it's really humans that need the upgrade in the operating system in order to create those technologies that we need. And I think practically what that looks like is create open sourced technologies, right? Where people from all different types of diverse backgrounds can start to build on those frameworks. Like if you look at uh, uh, ChatGPT, it's something that anybody could use. You could put it in an API and then ultimately, you know, it's, it's standardized to where, how you want to utilize that technology. So all I'm saying is that getting back to those indigenous practices of how we relate to things and the relationships that we create, I think could be really beneficial for the future. Lovely statement. We're getting so much interaction in our chat. I mean, everybody's tuning in. It's like, wow, you guys are really on, on, onto something here as we move forward, because this is a good discussion to have. I want to bring something up that I found interesting. And I was looking at Dr. Ed and what he does. He's a vice president, customer engagement, privacy officer. But he says, I'm a parent and I'm deeply concerned how we're going to make education relevant for careers that don't even exist today. I want you to elaborate on what you're talking about there. Um, sure, there's been a few uh, of us that have talked about um, generative AI such as ChatGPT. Uh, and I think that the key here is, you know, I think a lot of people like see this and We've been here in Alberta, we've been talking uh, a lot about commodities like the oil and gas price. And right now we're kind of in a tech slump. And what happens with commodities is uh, like programming, for example, is becoming commodities. So what happens when everybody when tech is down, everybody gets fired at the same time. Everybody's looking for a job at the same time. Uh, and what the same thing is happening in other fields. So it could be writing or graphic design. Everything becomes a commodity. And so in those cases, you really have to ask the question of what are you going to do that's going to maintain that difference over a long period of time? And right now uh, in our society, we have over half of our um, Gen Zs who are working, they are freelancing. They're using platforms like uh, Fiverr or Upwork. And in those kind of cases, your boss is not another human being. Your boss is an AI, right? The AI determines what type of opportunities will be available to you. It determines who bubbles up to the top. So you better know that AI uh, because you are going to be at a severe disadvantage compared to people who do not. Um, the, the thing I often add is that, you know, uh, in China, for example, they, they're teaching AI in kindergarten all the way up to grade 12. There's a curriculum. By the time these kids graduate from school, they're already going to be world experts on AI. And AI is just power. You know, it's just power who controls uh, attention on the Internet. It's, it's the power to control whether or not you succeed or you don't succeed. Uh, so you must know this. And uh, I used to think that when I went to school, Oh, I, if you want to learn like technology and AI, you need to go and study math and science. But when I went into industry, I realized that, no, I should have paid more attention in social studies. Mm -hmm. I should have taken a history lesson or two because AI is power. It is power to determine who gets what, where, when and how, especially on the Internet. And so know this power. It's not about learning code. You may never write a line of code in your life, but you will use AI every time you do a search, every time you watch a video or a post, uh, and when you apply for a job on LinkedIn. Uh, so these are the kinds of things that I feel like, f especially for kids, I don't know what kind of jobs are going to be out there, but I do know you better know AI. <laughs> you better know that base infrastructure uh, if you want to be successful. So that's kind of my, my emphasis. <laughs> that, that's beautiful. I mean, what you stated there is a reality. This is a huge game changer. No other uh, technology has been adopted so quickly, like genitive AI, audio AI. It is a absolute game changer. It's changing careers. It's changing business rapidly. And then there's, there's a lot of about faces. As you see, Google's even laying up. They're like, whoa, big Google, Google? who's now under you know, government uh, scrutiny about being a monopoly, like, whoa, wait a minute, I just lost $100 billion in stock just because of one technology, but has a good use case. 
a good use case. I want to. I see Barack over there. I want to call him Barack Barrett. I'm sorry if I pronounced your name a little wrong. I want you to chime in on this because you speak a lot about blockchain. You speak a lot about you know the digital economy. You see what's the change. What do you see that's happening now with AI on the scene? Well, um, what we see is, um, as, 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 as I said earlier, like this is a big shift. But here, Christopher actually said what needs to be said is we have to remove ourselves from high cycle expressions. The human um, uh, humans always adapt. And when, when, when it comes to, to, uh, to the digital economy, as you said, like 100 billion lost from Google, but, they will recover. They will recover. Why? Because the technology is well expanding. They have their base. They have um, 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 the the how how do you call it? Um, they have the technology behind it. They are still working on it. Yeah. They don't want to actually. I mean, we 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 all heard that. Yeah, it was a red alert in in Google, and they are actually running around now because you know Bing and and Microsoft did it before them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You cannot believe this because you know that they are a big player here, and and as we we're talking about the governments and let let, let the people work and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, there is a monopoly, and this monopoly will not we we will not lose it. The monopoly is here. The, 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 these people are still here, and 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 they will they will only expand from here. You cannot lose, um, and this is a prediction. We cannot. I mean, the world will not lose the GAFAM as 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 we know them, and they will expand from here. They will only expand from here. Mm. This is interesting. I see Dr. Oz. I'm calling me Dr. Oz. <laughs> ah, you're shaking your head. What's what's on your mind? Uh, because I I totally agree with uh, Barik about this that that Google Google's fall when when Google fell when I heard about the 100 billion deficit I I, I told myself okay now I have to buy a stock because it's uh, it's it's come on guys it's Google I mean at the end of the day they have the people yes they had a mistake but they still have the technology they will still recover and i do agree with this point so for me it's it was like uh, okay i i should i should find a one thousand dollars to buy uh, but i don't so it, i don't have it so it's fine but the the the, the anyway to to wrap uh, up before i also i had i had to say something about giselle's uh, note before about normal being normal and normalization and all this discussion i think this is this is a nice point here because being standard or being normal, it's something that I, I, I connect again to video games, but I think maybe it's, it's, it's quite interesting, this, this little uh, hooks about video games as well, but the, the idea of being normal doesn't exist. So in, in a video game, because you are taking another person or another role of another character that is not you. And this is kind of, um, and as a, uh, being a this I don't like to say disabled, but being a person with a with a with a, um, a different abilities, let's say, or with a different kind of uh, skill set, it's something particular. This is this is what you have that is extra. So someone someone that doesn't speak, okay, so they will be able to do something else better. Someone that doesn't see, they will be able to do something else better. And this is something that we have to remember. And the same goes for, by the way, for third world countries. I would say that people that live in a third world country have something that we don't have. Something, maybe the community, sense of community, maybe the sense of family, maybe the sense, whatever that is they have, I believe that they, are, they have something that we don't have. And I think that this being, a, being able to, so I think one of our challenges is also to be able to, to take it all in without destroying our strength, let's say, to, to gather everybody, but without destroying our foundations that we already have. I think that's a powerful statement you just made. I'm always reminded, we had this discussion that was going over in my mind, and I was thinking about the movie Avatar, and I just remembered how, you know, this person was a disabled uh, Marine, and then he got transported into a whole new body, and then a whole new culture that he ended up adopting because he was it was an enablement um, for him. 
And I think that's something as we get ready to close that what we're building together, what we're you know looking at together, us here, that we, we are game changers. We can change the lives of so many people. I loved your description of someone just being able to put lipstick on. Something as simple as that, or to be able to conceptualize a home when you're homeless. I mean, that's that's beautiful. When you can have someone who's blind that can actually play a guitar, man, I mean, your vision, I mean, what you guys are doing is beautiful. It makes our world a much more inclusive, place because we're actually paying attention to our, our our people in our society and we're helping them we're not just putting tech, tech out there to put tech out there here's a whole new way of getting your energy your data your money from you no let, let's try to help our society become better that's that's the point i, I see dr ed up there just smiling away who we got we got Four minutes. Can I can I make? Yeah, a if I can uh, add. Oh, oh um, Zach, um, what I wanted to add was that the I think that the the community actually already supports like the metaverse already well supports uh, individuals with disabilities. And um, if I look at like even the the job market, uh, for example, in in China, um, there are many people who are pushed out of the workforce uh, in China who are able to make a living uh, as a even as a disabled worker uh, by helping to like do tagging and creating information systems online. Uh, and I think it's important to recognize that these individuals have a lot to contribute. They're not just like we're doing this as a type of charity. It's like they are more reflective about the type of work that they do. They're more thoughtful when it comes to the organization. They're more organized than, than many individuals um, in a regular workforce. They have unique skills that we need to leverage more and we need to treat them as an important resource, not just this charity uh, work that we're, we're doing for, for people. Um, it's not that. It's like they actually have something to contribute. It's just that it's hard to because they don't have the able body, but they have very able minds. And I think we uh, are missing out on a lot of the resource that exists if we don't take advantage of uh, their a very able minds. Absolutely. Absolutely. Dulce, you like to chime in? Oh, I just wanted to say that um, I think we really have to start with or really take a deep look at our education system and know that it is still rooted in the 20th century of creating workers to work in factories or to work um, assembly line jobs. And we're not we're not that anymore. We have moved completely away from that. And we're now to the point where AI is going to start making our art for us too. So, you know, even if we want to be creative and not be an assembly line worker and we want to be a rock star, you know, that's no longer a true career path either. And thinking about how we educate our future generations with this technology, with AI, I get excited to see um, Dr. Ed's AI parenting because one of my passionate things is I eventually would like to make AI babies that grow up with human babies and become companions with them and you know, guide them for the rest of their lives and then convert into being a digital representation of them after they pass. Um, you know, I think that's the future. We're going to be heading in that direction. And we need to start training our new generations to think in that way and to understand that, you know, these AI tools are just that to tools to prompt and manifest things instantly. It's the idea of the singularity where you think it and you manifest it in your hands instantly. We're heading in that direction. So it's about training a new generation to think and feel that way, I think. Man, we got one minute. Uh, Giselle, everybody will get one minute. Everybody will get one minute. Go right I ahead. Just, I just been extremely inspired by everyone today on the panel. I hope that everyone listening will follow everyone's projects and that we can inspire people to think differently like what Dulce just said. Excellent. I, excellent. Marquise. Yeah, um, I just like to say, you know, um, looking to the future, I think we need to also look to the past, right? And I think we also need to open up our ideas and our minds to understanding developing countries, right? Or countries that are about to make a leapfrog with this technology, you know, because the way that they integrate with the earth and the way that they are able to understand kind of the broader principles of how technology works 
I mean, if we talk about technology, to, uh, the earth is what, 4.5 billion years of iteration over and over to create these relationships that create this consciousness that we're here right now. So add that layer of modern technology onto that. I think we can start to build some really amazing future society. So opening up that aspect of uh, involving a diverse uh, language and, and perspective, I think is going to be really important. Awesome. 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 Ah, do you like to give some final thoughts? Uh, just, I will just say a sentence, make your, stay happy, make people around you happy and, uh, and take care of them. That's first of all, let's take care of our community and then see what goes up, what goes after. Thank you. And all the way in Djibouti, we got. Yes. Um, uh, it, it, um, thank you us because this, this will be actually a great segue for, for what, what I will say. I, I have, I have read before a comment say, let the people and the communities free, freely express themselves. Well, uh, when you come with, um, um, I'm still talking on, on the government perspective here, guys. Um, we have, we have a country with, um, 68 to 70% of the population working in the public sector. So we are opening now, we are opening now and we are pushing for, for the private sector and we are pushing communities. So we have, we, the government actually needs, needs and, and to, 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 to accompany them. You see? So that was, that was the, the, the last thing I wanted to say. And thank you guys. And it's a, it's a really, it's a real honor to be, to be with you. No, thank you everybody. This panel has been wonderful. One thing I'll leave everybody with, remember your imagination is what powers the universe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Tune in for our next show or click on our website at www.firestarbdm slash follow the brand TV. Thank you. Hey everyone, it's Grant McGall. CEO of Five Star BDM and host of the award-winning Follow the Brand podcast and TV series, where I help you to build a five-star brand that people will follow. My genius is personal brand development through intelligent communication and helping you achieve your business and career goals. I am a requested speaker on digital technology and brand development issues. I want to work with you to increase the value of your current opportunities while attracting new ones. Every one of you is unique and we all share challenges that can be addressed through smart branding. As a super connector, I work with you as an executive coach to guide you along the complicated business and career development road providing the enhancement tool and information you need to succeed. Together, I will help you succeed in today's challenging business climate. I will evaluate and measure your progress. Best of all, I am right alongside you every step of the way. Build the brand called you. Genius is coming.